Greetings, Internet. I am the Liptus Starfish. Today, I'd like to talk about The Owl House, an isekai anime on the Disney Channel created by Dana Terrace for what I believe to be a target audience of 9 to 14 years old. The show follows Luz Noceta, an adorable human girl and viewer surrogate with a wild imagination who gets sent to reality check summer camp because of the aforementioned wild imagination. More on that later. But misses the bus because a bird took her book. She chases after the bird, and it leads her into the Boiling Isles, a fantasy realm where demons rule, and supposedly the source of all myths and legends in the human realm. Also, giraffes come from there, apparently. By the way, when I say that demons rule, I don't mean demons in the traditional sense. Demons are essentially just any type of animal on the Boiling Isles, which is why I didn't say witches and demons, because as far as I can tell, witch is just a term used to describe a specific class of demon one that is capable of forming human-like social structures, and different demon species of this class can and do mingle regularly. So, while Basha and Principal Bump are clearly not the same species as the main witch cast, they are still classified as witches due to their cognitive ability, and I will be referring to them as such. Going back to the main premise, the owl that stole Luce's book belongs to a wise old witch named Ida, who takes a liking to Luce and becomes the de facto mom character for the rest of the show. The two of them, plus Ida's pet demon, King, make up the main trio of the show, with the B-plot of each episode typically revolving around either Ida or King, while the A-plot focuses on Luce. On the Boiling Isles, Luce learns plenty of lessons, as one would expect from a show on a children's network. The most important aspect of this, though, is the way that it's approached. An issue that I found to be almost chronic in the shows that I watched when I was young was that most of them were patronizing about their lessons, I found this very annoying. Fortunately, save for episodes 1 and 2, the Owl House completely bucks this trend. Speaking of which, let's talk about the worst episode of the show, episode 1. Now, the opener for this episode is actually pretty good. Foolish child! I could swallow you whole! Do not underestimate me, Gilder Snake. For I am the good witch Azura, warrior of peace. Now eat this, sucker! No! My only weakness! Dying! I think this is actually a great establishment of Luce's character. She's altruistic, eccentric, fairly courageous, and absolutely fucking nuts. That last trait is the most interesting because it's not always a good thing. However, as you may have gathered, this is not Luce. The girl in the clip says that she is the good witch Azura, who is the main character of Luce's favorite book franchise. Luce is this adorable little shorthead creature. The first time we see Luce, she is in the principal's office for bringing snakes into her class. Real snakes. Ones that breathe, eat, shit, etc. This, among other things, is the reason she's being sent to the reality check summer camp that I mentioned earlier. Now, this is the beginning of the issues I have with the first episode. I have two main problems with this episode. The first and primary is the lack of subtlety. Don't misunderstand me, not everything needs to be subtle. And most things in this show are unsubtle, and that's not an issue. The problem here is that it's so unsubtle, it's patronizing. The second issue, which compounds the first, is that the message is kind of backwards. You see, I mentioned a moment ago that Luce is a bit of a nutcase, which in itself is not a bad thing. The problem is that she often takes it too far, as we saw with the snakes, and we also see that she'd previously brought dozens of live spiders into her class for another presentation. Throughout the rest of the show, we are shown how Luce's lack of proper grip on reality can be problematic and have severe consequences, which is good. And I do think they were trying to show this with Luce in the first episode. Unfortunately, it's not framed very well, and my partner and I both thought we were meant to see Luce as sympathetic and just a little wacky. Combine that with the overall message of the episode, which is the same message that every children's show has at some point, it's okay to be yourself, and you can easily see why I think this episode is terrible. It tries to show the viewer examples of Luce being problematic, and then we're immediately hit with Us weirdos have to stick together and then shown people who are in prison because they like to write weird fanfic and talk about conspiracy theories. Don't misunderstand me, I think it's a very important thing that children hear that they're not invalid just because they're a little weird. There's a reason every children's show has an episode about it. 
Unfortunately, as previously stated, this episode is extremely patronizing about its message, and because this message is in every show, I know that if I watched this when I was nine years old, I would have been more annoyed than reassured. And of course, there's the problem where Luce is so lost in her own fantasy that it is problematic. Fortunately, the second episode seems to try to make up for all of this, and is a lot better because of it. In it, we see a potential worst-case scenario for Luce if she indulges in her fantastic tendencies too much. As somebody who likely grew up reading the likes of Harry Potter and Percy Jackson, both escapist fantasies, Luce believes that she must be special, or otherwise she would not have been summoned to the Boiling Isles. The problem is that Luce wasn't summoned to the Boiling Isles. She stumbled into it after a bird from there took her book. This is the fantastic thinking that I mentioned before, demonstrating her loose grip on reality. Also, here's a fun game you want to play if you want to die. Take a shot every time I say loose grip on reality or a variation thereof. This thinking results in an opportunistic demon disguised as a quest-giving wizard preying on all of Luce's assumptions about being in this fantasy world. The quest plays to all of those assumptions, leading her further into his trap. At the end of the quest, it's revealed to Luce that it was just a trap to lure Ida out so the puppet demon could consume her for her power. But the point of this episode, I think, is very clear. It's to demonstrate that Luce's weirdoness is not the same as Ida's or other people from the prison. Luce has become so wrapped up in her own fantasies that it's become a danger to herself and those around her. The episode ends with everybody relatively unscathed, but Luce is starting to get that much-needed reality check. So this is the section where I talk about a bunch of unsubtle things that the Owl House does that I think deserve praise. As I mentioned at the beginning, subtlety is not a necessity for getting a message across. However, you do need to avoid being patronizing. Ida's curse is a great example. Ida's curse is only a metaphor for chronic illness in the strictest sense. I mean, it's not hard to argue that it just straight up is a chronic illness. The elixir she has to take is just a different word for medication. What's more is that it's then used as a vehicle to unsubtly talk about other important issues, like how opportunistic capitalists take advantage of people with chronic illnesses. A great example of this is diabetes, and how people with diabetes regularly need to take insulin. However, insulin is extremely expensive due to the oligopolistic nature of the industry. Same goes for people with allergies. People with allergies need EpiPens, which are not cheap in the slightest. The Owl House comments on this by showing when Ida runs out of elixir and her supplier also is out, she needs to get it from an underground supplier where a literal capitalist pig charges extortionist prices. This isn't even a metaphor at this point. It's literally just somebody being denied life-saving health care because of extortionist medical practices. A thousand snails? What kind of game are you playing? Capitalism, where everyone wins except you. Another one that's also a fairly blatant metaphor is the Emperor's Coven. I think it's very clear that the Emperor's Coven is meant to appear as a cult. The most important part of this, though, is Lilith. Lilith is Ida's older sister and is a member of the Emperor's Coven. After meeting her, we see Lilith repeatedly try to get Ida to join the Emperor's Coven, mirroring how people will try to bring loved ones back into their faith after they've left. Moreover, Lilith's primary motivation is that she believes Ida's curse will be lifted by the Emperor when she joined, or, to put it in clearer terms, she's trying to save Ida. Again, all of this is relatively unsubtle, and I think that's good. Oftentimes, when the message is too subtle, kids don't even get the message. I'm not saying we should insult their intelligence by patronizing them, clearly, but don't hide everything in obscure metaphor either. Now, let's talk about Ida. Ida is my favorite character for a variety of reasons. First, I truly do believe that if she were a real person, she would just be me but a woman. Also, so she's sexy as fuck. But also, I think that she's a neat spin on the wise older mentor trope. You see, Ida isn't the standard, widely respected old witch that everybody comes to to solve their problems. She's an outlaw who sells random human world crap she pretends to understand, as well as regularly scamming people. She's not exactly the paragon of virtue that Gandalf or Dumbledore were. My favorite thing about her, though, is that she's essentially the voice of individualism. You see, an important message that I think kids need to hear, and one that I like to think Dana Terrace agrees with, is that they are their own person, which has not frequently gotten across in Western society, or at least the United States. You see, in the U.S., children aren't treated much better than slaves. 
You might think that sounds terrible, and that's because it is. Unfortunately, many of you who are thinking, oh, that sounds terrible, probably don't even realize that you yourself are treating your child like a slave. Many parents tell their children how to dress, speak, think, and oftentimes the state forces children to go to school, where they're forced to study things they may not be interested in, and sometimes not even allowed to study things that they are. On top of being told to study subjects they're not interested in, they're also told that if they don't do well in these subjects, then they're less of a person. Now, very few children are told this directly, but holy shit, I know that when I was in school, I felt that way. And conversations with others has led me to think that most kids likely felt that way as well. Assuming you didn't already grow up in it, really try to imagine how it must feel for millions of kids globally as they're told over and over again to repeatedly do things they don't want to do or not do things that they want to do, when most of these things have relatively little consequence. And I'm not just talking about schools. As I said a moment ago, many parents tell their kids how to dress, speak, and think. No, you can't wear a dress because boys don't wear dresses. No, you can't get your hair cut because I like the way it looks better when it's long. No, you can't put that tie on over your t-shirt because it looks dumb. I'm taking you to go get your ears pierced because I think these earrings would look cute on you, and I don't care what you have to say about it. This is incredibly harmful because whether or not it's intended, this teaches children that they aren't their own person, and more importantly, that consent doesn't matter. Now, bringing this back to Ida in the Owl House, Ida is the vehicle by which this individualist philosophy is imparted onto the viewer. You see, in the episode Convention, we learn both what covens are and why Ida is an outlaw. The coven system is introduced to us via a job fair called Convention, and Ida explains to Luce why she never joined a coven and kind of just starts preaching about individualism. Now, I'll talk more about the specifics of covens later, but putting aside the fact that on the Boiling Isles they only exist to control witches, Covens are meant to be analogs for workers' unions. I don't have much to say on the matter of workers' unions, because I know pretty much fuck all about them, but I've been told that it's only a little exaggerated. The important part, though, is that Luce, the viewer surrogate, responds to Ida's preaching in literally the best possible way, as an individualist. I get it, Ida. Covens bad, individualism good. But I'm still figuring this world out, so I'm going to go in there and make up my own mind, okay? You see, if Luce had just blindly listened to what this free thinker was preaching, she'd be going against the very doctrine of free thought that was being preached. Speaking of free thought, this eventually leads Ida to the conclusion that she needs to enroll Luce into Hexide, a school for witches. Now, this isn't actually something I've heard talked much about, but I think it's one of the most, if not the most, important moments in the Owl House. You see, as I said a moment ago, children aren't treated much better than slaves in the U.S. and presumably most of Western society, and this extends to mentality. Many parents are under the unfortunate delusion that their children belong to them in some capacity. Now, whether or not a given parent acknowledges this varies. But, barring beatings and other physical forms of abuse such as molestation, the law often supports this mentality. Again, parents are allowed to choose where their kids go to school, how they dress, talk, and what they do to their bodies, and, in many cases, aren't even allowed privacy. Now, parents, if you fit any of the descriptions I've just given, I've got news for you. You don't own your fucking child. The child that you parent is a human being with human thoughts and feelings. If that person wants to grow their hair out, you do not have the right to cut their hair without permission. If that person wants to wear a tutu, you do not have the right to take it off. If that person has no interest in getting their ears pierced and has actively expressed a desire not to have their ears pierced, you sure as hell have no right to get their damn ears pierced. Now, drawing this back to the Owl House, Ida is essentially Luce's mom. Ida hates Hexide. She thinks that it's one of the biggest problems with Bonesboro and that the schools on the Boiling Isles in general are bad and shouldn't exist. However, Luce wants to become a witch, and the best way that Luce thinks she can do that is by going to a magical school like Hexide. Luce wants to go to Hexide. So, Ida is in a situation where she hates school on the Boiling Isles and thinks that they're immensely problematic, but her daughter wants to go to school to become a witch. So, what does Ida do? She enrolls Luce into Hexide. 
She acknowledges that Luce is her own person and that she has the right to an education wherever she wants to get it. Ida can complain about Hexide and how it's corrupt until the cows come home, but Ida has no right to pull Luce out of or prohibit her from attending Hexide, which she eventually realizes. I cannot express how important it is that both parents and children hear this kind of message. Now, I'd like to move on and talk about Amity, but first I have a section in every video which I call the Fuck Sponsorship section. This section is dedicated to two things. First, I tell you, the viewer, that I do not, have not, and hope to never take sponsorships in my videos. The reason being that I personally believe it limits my creative freedom, and I know that very few people like to hear sponsorships. For this reason, I am asking that all viewers with the ability to do so, and by ability I mean the disposable income, donate to me on the platform of your choosing. If you're watching this on a platform that supports it, send me a tip. You can also use Libra Pay or PayPal and other methods, including a couple cryptocurrencies directly if you want. Links for doing so will be provided in the description. The second section, and arguably more important one, is for a non-sponsored plug. You see, while I will not take sponsorships, if I come across something that I think people should know about, I might do a showcase for it. Now, the criteria for each plug is as follows. It must be open source, and all software must be freedom respecting, as I think that all other software is unethical. Now, for this video's unsponsored plug, I'll be talking about the very software I edited this video on. Are you wanting to get into YouTube or try your hand at video editing, but can't because you're dirt fucking poor and can't afford Sony Vegas or Adobe Creative Cloud? Well, fuck them, because those are proprietary garbage that nobody should be using anyway. The program that I use to edit every video that I make is created and maintained by an international community of freedom-respecting developers called KDE. The program is called Caden Live and is free and open source, which means that you can do whatever the fuck you want with it including look at the code and make your own version. There's no premium version of the app, and they, like me, are funded exclusively through donations. So, if you've been paying out the ass for an Adobe subscription or have been giving Sony ash loads of cash for Vegas, your wallet just got a little fatter, because you can get Caden Live for the low, low price of fuck all. That's Caden Live, K-D-E-N-L-I-V-E. Again, this segment is non-sponsored because sponsorships make me dependent on people who aren't my audience and creatively limit me. I just really like Caden Live. Now, let's talk about Amity, another one of the best characters. However, I'll be talking briefly about Willow because she's important to Amity's development. We meet both Willow and Amity in Episode 3. Willow and Amity are basically introduced as Ron Weasley and Draco Malfoy. However, as the show goes on, we learn that Amity and Willow used to be very good friends, and later we learn why they stopped being friends. Now, Amity only starts out as a Draco character, but she quickly is fleshed out to much more than Draco. Though I've never really read Harry Potter and it's been ages since I've watched the movies, but I will confidently say that Amity is a much better character than Draco. A really important detail about Amity is that we see that she's not a total shithead all the time. There's an episode where we see her reading to some children, showing the kind of affection anyone who's not a total piece of shit would show to children. The important part, however, is that it's not the kind of backhanded affection you would see from a comically evil cartoon character where she shows contempt and disgust after the kids leave. She actually cares about and enjoys reading to the kids. Now, eventually, Amity does join Team Good Guys, but the important part about it is that it's not instant. It takes time, as it would in reality. After she stops being antagonistic toward the main trio of Luce, Willow, and Gus, she mostly just keeps her distance. And even when she is doing that, her own insecurities do lead her to doing some pretty stupid shit. One of the most important episodes for Amity's character development sees her trying to destroy one of Willow's memories involving her, but she accidentally destroys other memories in the process and needs to go inside of Willow's mind with Luce to repair them. This is when we learn the reason why their original friendship ended. You see, Amity is a member of the Blight family, which has a very high reputation to the point where it's very important who they associate with. It's because of this that Amity's parents decide that, because of Willow's relatively weak magical ability, that she cannot continue to be friends with Amity. 
And to ensure this, they go as far as to tell Amity that if she doesn't cut Willow out of her life, that they will use their connections to ruin any chance that Willow has at getting a proper education. Note that all of this happened when they were very young, probably around seven or eight years old. Now, what I do find interesting about this particular scenario is that, unless I'm mistaken, in the West, family reputation doesn't really exist unless you're the Kardashians. However, from watching more than my fair share of Japanese cartoons, I can confidently say that family reputation is very important over there. So, while this particular topic isn't something that I think many Western audiences will be able to relate to very much, given that Disney is a global superpower and they're the most popular animation studio in Japan, I think it's safe to say that at least a few Japanese kids who watch this will be able to relate to Amity's plight. The episode ends with Amity and Willow reconciling, but not quite being friends yet. This is the right decision from a writing perspective. It would be far too unrealistic if they were friends immediately after this, with what was probably the better part of a decade's worth of harassment and abuse for both of them to come to terms with. Willow would need to come to terms with Amity's abuse and forgive her, which isn't always possible, and Amity would have to come to terms with what she spent the last several years doing and forgive herself. Note that when I say that Willow needs to forgive Amity, I only mean that it's a requirement if they want to be friends again anytime soon. I am not saying that Willow owes Amity any forgiveness, because she doesn't. Hell, forgiveness is a pretty vague concept, and I'm not even sure it would be necessary for them to become friends again, but my point still stands. They would need time, and I appreciate this realistic portrayal. Now, for those of you who have seen the show and want me to talk about the gay bits... I don't have anything that hasn't already been said better by Lily Orchard and Michaela Turkelson, so I'll just link to their content in the description, but that's about all I have to say on Amity. So, I know I talked about it in the beginning of the video, but I want to circle back and talk about Luce's general lack of restraint and poor judgment. Now, nobody should expect a teen to be perfect at decision-making. Hell, I'm more than 20 years old, and my decision-making skills are far from perfect. However, Luce's decision-making skills, or lack thereof, are actively detrimental to the well-being of herself and those around her. As previously mentioned, Episode 2 showcases this very well, hitting us right off the bat with the worst-case scenario, wherein her willingness to indulge her fantasy nearly gets Ida, King, and herself all killed. Luce's tendencies don't end there, though, which is another example of excellent writing that I can't praise enough. Too often in children's programming is the viewer shown a montage of a character exhibiting a negative characteristic. The other characters then complain about this characteristic, then something really bad happens that teaches the character why they shouldn't exhibit said characteristic, and then they never exhibit it again. It's extremely lazy, and it's great that the Owl House doesn't do it. The flaws that these characters have are a part of them and need to be overcome through repetition. Speaking personally, just because I know that I've got a bad habit doesn't mean I'll always realize when I'm doing it, and more often than not, I'll need to be reminded by those around me when I'm dipping back into bad habits. The same thing is true for Luce. In the episode Wing It Like Witches, Luce ends up challenging the Grudgeby team captain, Basha, to a Grudgeby match on Willow's behalf and for her honor. She drags Willow into a sports ball match even after Willow tells her that she'd rather just talk things out. When Willow makes it very clear that she doesn't see it going well, and even Amity tells them that it's a really stupid idea, how does Luce justify it? Fucking sports movies. Luce, this isn't a good idea. Yeah, I've never even played Grudge Me before. How am I supposed to be Basha? But you're the better witch. I don't know much about sports, but I do know about sports movies. We, too, are a ragtag team of lovable misfits joined together to defeat a powerful enemy. With a little team spirit and a training montage, we can win. If that wasn't enough, during a practice round, Luce tries a move after Willow is clearly too tired and pushes her well over the line. Gus's flags break and Willow's hairpin breaks, which, based on her reaction, was very important to her. When Luce continues pushing Willow to play using sports movie logic, Willow shuts her down and essentially tells her to fuck off. The episode does end with Team Willow winning, but that's only because Amity, the former team captain, helped them. Oh yeah, and technically they didn't win because this episode really was just an episode for Dana to vent about Quidditch. Quidditch aside, we are once again shown that Luce being stuck in fantasy is going to get herself and her friends hurt, 
She needs to learn to approach things realistically and remember to respect the people around her. This lesson is very important, and I don't think it's taught enough in children's television. As I've stated before, you hear many lessons about self-acceptance, which is good. We need those, but we've got plenty of those. What we don't have a lot of is lessons about how not to be a dick and how to respect boundaries. And it's good that the Owl House is touching on it. Now, let's jump to world building. Some people love it, some people hate it, and I'm going to call some of y'all fuckers out. I know some of you would rather I not talk about it at all, but I think it's necessary to talk about it in stories that take place outside of our own world. Now, don't misunderstand me when I say that there's a right way and a wrong way to do world building. The Owl House is very much in the former camp, and nothing needs to change about it. I have very little, if any, criticism for the way that the Owl House does its world building. What I really want to talk about right now is toxic fandom. First, however, I would like to talk about a book written by Shad Brooks, also known as Shad Adversity, here on the internet. The book I'm referring to is his only published work at the time of writing, Shadow of the Conqueror. This is another work of fiction where I think the world building is done very well. You see, Shadow of the Conqueror is very clearly a story which was written as a showcase for the world it takes place in, Everfall. When Shad starts talking about certain aspects of the world, he's doing so because he put it there to be talked about and wants to share it with the reader, and the story was crafted in a way to facilitate that. The example I'll be using is Dalen's suicide note. This suicide is attempted at the beginning of the story, so it's not a spoiler. The problem that Shad is trying to solve here is that he wants to share with the reader the history of the world he's made as well as the history of a more than 80-year-old main character. How do you go about doing that? Well, rather than having a main character who has no right knowing as much as they do explain it to the protagonist, as is often done in isekai anime, or having the protagonist spend an entire chapter just telling it to the reader, which would very likely get boring, Shad did something very clever. The book starts with Dalen finishing up a very long suicide note, which is essentially a recounting of his life from his own perspective, which, being a former world leader, includes a lot of significant world history. Bits of this note are then shown to the reader at the beginning of every chapter, so as not to bore the reader with overwhelming detail all at once. This organically provides the reader with a recounting of the history of the character and the world that we're reading about, a history that is very important to the story. As far as I can tell, most of what was said in the note is relevant to either the story or the character, and even if it wasn't, it was something that Shad thought was interesting enough to include anyway. The other important part is that most of what was relevant ended up becoming relevant in the very chapter it starts off. Now, coming back to the Owl House, we know almost nothing of the history of the Boiling Isles until the finale. Why is this? Well, remember a moment ago when I said that most of Dalen's suicide note was relevant to the story? Well, most of the Boiling Isles history isn't important until the finale. And when we get there, we're only given the bits that we need. You see, in contrast to Everfall and Shadow of the Conqueror, where the story was made as a showcase for the world, the Boiling Isles was built as a stage for the Owl House's stories to be told on. Note that I'm not trying to say that either of these approaches to world building are better than the other. World building should be done at the builder's discretion, and I'm sorry fans, but if you want more world building, go write a fanfic, or find another story that's meant to showcase a world. Like Shadow of the Conqueror, or Lord of the Rings, or go watch Noble 87 if you want some World of Warcraft lore, or read The Wheel of Time. But for the love of God, stop begging people who didn't make worlds to be explored to start exploring them. Dana Terrace didn't build a world to be explored. She built it to tell a story. Let her tell her damn story. And don't beg her to tell us more about aspects of the world she likely hasn't even considered. Now that I've arguably made the most important point to some of you, let's move on to the actual world building of the Owl House. As previously mentioned, the Boiling Isles was made as a stage for the story of the Owl House. So, what is that story? Well, it's a slice-of-life comedy horror about a 14-year-old self-insert girl with a very loose grip on reality, who gets sent to what she initially believes is the fantasy world of her dreams. Because loose is meant to be a viewer surrogate and the target demographic is children between 9 and 14, a school is necessary to keep it relatable, but adapted to the fantasy setting. Instead of arithmetic and chemistry, you'll be learning how to tell the future and alchemy, magical chemistry. For the sake of teaching lessons to children, it needs to have real-world problems, or problems analogous to those, and given the protagonist's status of chronic detachment from reality, she also needs to be as unspecial as possible. 
on the Boiling Isles, Luce is essentially disabled, being unable to do magic without an aid of some kind. And she wasn't chosen. She just happened to be nearby when Ida's magic owl was looking for some trash for her to sell. Now, she was able to break through a magic barrier, but that's because she's human, not because of anything particularly special about her. Dana wants to have a story about individualism, and also wants to talk about how workers' unions kind of suck. So, she adds a system that strips people of their individuality by literally branding them with the symbol of a group, and then said group was basically a workers' union that locks away the ability for a witch to use more than one school of magic. What I'm trying to get at here is that the world was given its characteristics to facilitate the story that Dana wanted to tell. Unless I'm informed otherwise, I'm going to assume that Dana hasn't thought about any particular aspect of the world unless it was meant to facilitate the story she wanted to tell. And that's good. If Dana wants to tell a story, first and foremost, focusing on aspects of the world that don't have much impact on that story is only going to take up more time that could be better used ironing out the story itself. Keep up the good work, Dana. You're doing some good shit. So, I touched briefly on the Emperor's Coven earlier when I was talking about Lilith, but now I want to go into more detail. As I said earlier, the Emperor's Coven is a lot like a cult, and I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence that Emperor Bellos is dressed kinda like the Pope. Now, to demonstrate the Coven's cult-like tendencies, I'll be comparing it to Jehovah's Witness. Why Jehovah's Witness? Because I've been watching a lot of videos by Telltale lately, and he's an ex-member of the church, and because of that I've been learning a lot about it lately. Telltale also talks a lot about the bite model, which is mostly used to tell if a particular organization is a cult, though it can also just be used to detect authoritarian abuse, because cults really just tend to be authoritarian abuse applied to entire organizations, not just a handful of people. Bite is an acronym, with each letter referring to a specific type of control, those being behavior, information, thought, and emotion. In the case of Jehovah's Witness, they control behavior through shunning and the threat thereof. The Watchtower Society, which has been referred to as the governing body in more recent years, controls information by telling its followers that it is the only reliable source of information, with all other worldly information in some way or another being corrupted by Satan. Thoughts and emotions are controlled the same way that most religions control them, by telling people that certain thoughts and emotions are bad, and that thinking or feeling them, or even not thinking and not feeling certain things, are worthy of penance. You must love Jehovah and do as he directs. Now, looking at the Boiling Isles, the Emperor's Coven is more like the elders of the JW than the entire cult itself. Behavior is controlled by forcing people to join a coven, which strips a witch of most of their magical ability. Those who don't join a coven are dubbed wild witches, which is essentially an apostate. Schools literally teach children the doctrine that Bellos preaches, so information control is also down. Yes, Principal Bump allows students to study more than one track after Luce joins, but I think it's implied that it's less than orthodox, and if Emperor Bellows found out, some less than savory things would happen to Bump. Thought Control only has one real example, but it's a really fucking big one. Ida is very critical of the Coven system and the Emperor as a whole and is nearly killed for doing so. The only one there's no real evidence for is the emotional control, but 3 out of 4 is still a big deal. The goal is none. However, even without the bite model, I was able to realize that the Emperor's Coven was a cult based solely on one thing. Lilith. Lilith is very clearly the model of an evangelist, and spends the vast majority of her on-screen time trying to save her sister. And if you've ever been in a cult or talked with religious evangelists, you will know just how important it is to them that they save you. What's super fucking rich is that they even pull the bait and switch. When Lilith finally is able to capture Ida, instead of healing her like Bello said he would, he instead tells Lilith that the Titan has decided that Ida needs to be made an example, and will be petrified instead. This is also the reason I brought up Jehovah's Witness. You see, aside from them being the cult that I'm most familiar with, Jehovah's Witness are notorious for their practice of shunning, whereby all excommunicated members, who are referred to as disfellowshipped, are rejected by all other members of the church. Did you leave the faith after coming across some compelling worldly evidence? Then your family will break off all contact with you, or at the very least, keep it minimal. Did you spend a night out drinking and end up hooking up with somebody, worldly or otherwise, but feel guilty and wish to repent? Well, too bad, because an elder in a particularly bad mood might just decide that you're not repentant enough, disfellowship you, and you will be shunned. Now, while Ida isn't exactly shunned, the purpose of shunning is to make an example of disfellowshipped persons keeping people in lockstep with the church. And in the Owl House, 
Emperor Bellos attempts to make an example out of Ida by petrifying her. Even after Ida manages to escape, she does so in her owl beast form, and the Emperor spins this as the example he wants to set. Children of the Isles, the Titan has told me to spare the Owl Lady's life, but in return, her curse will strip away all her powers. Let her monstrous form be a lesson about the dangers of wild magic. Now, I'm no good at segues, in case you haven't noticed, but this is my conclusion. The Owl House is a slice-of-life comedy with mild horror themes in which a young girl in desperate need of a reality check gets sent to a fantasy world and trains to become a witch, despite being essentially disabled. In this world, she learns many valuable lessons, most of which revolving around that much-needed reality check. There's also a sexy mom, an adorable king, an annoying but also terrifying literal owl house, and the gay. If any of this, or the stuff mentioned during the run of this review, sounded interesting to you, then I highly advise you watch the show. It's on Disney+. Plus. Thank you for paying attention to me for over 35 minutes. If you liked the video, you know what to do. If you didn't, obliterate that dislike button. If you want to see more videos of mine, subscribe. And if you want to support me financially, please use one of the many links provided in the description to do so. If there's something else you want me to cover, tell me in the comments and I'll consider it. Also, don't forget to check out Kaden Live if you need a video editor or just want to try your hand at it. Link in the description. This has been The Lifted Starfish. No, I don't have a sign-off yet.